This ad-free podcast is part of your Slate Plus membership. Hello, and welcome to the Child Care in the Chip Sect episode of Slate Money, your guide to the business and finance, and this week, politics news of the week. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios. I'm here with Emily Peck of Axios. Hello, hello. And Elizabeth Spires. Hi. We have a weirdly and unusually political episode this week, even unto the numbers round where we talk about AOC's Met Ball shenanigans. We are going to talk about the CHIPS Act and what it is mandating in terms of childcare. We are going to talk about the veto that President Biden is using to override a bill that was passed, which was in opposition to a Department of Labor law about retirement, something, something, something. You will understand it all by the time the segment is over. Um, we are going to talk about Better.com and Amazon and the idea of using stock to make a down payment on a house. And we have a Slate Plus on ordering the same meal in restaurants. It's all coming up on Slate Money. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use or that can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on creditworthiness. Rates as of January 1st, 2023. So Emily, kick us off here with a little bit of social and cultural engineering being done by the Biden administration as part of the CHIPS Act. What is going on? So the Biden administration, specifically the Commerce Department this week, came out and said to companies that want to build chip manufacturing plants, great, build those plants. But if you do, if you're planning on it, we want to see your child care plan. We want to know that you have something in mind for your workers, children. We want to know what kind of childcare they can access. Um, maybe it's on site. Maybe you're going to do subsidies for them, but you must have some kind of childcare plan in place if you want to get CHIPS Act funding. I saw this. I was like, this is amazing. So the reason they're saying at the Commerce Department is that there's a labor shortage right now. Um subsidized affordable childcare will help more people work and get into the labor market and actually get these plants built on time. Also, the Biden administration tried to do its own like childcare legislation and build back better. And that did not work out. So it's kind of also, if you want to look at it more cynically, kind of a backdoor policy making situation. And I was excited about it, but subsequently there was a lot of criticism, like this is going to make it harder for these plants to get built. This is going to make it more expensive for the manufacturers. That's what kind of conservative economists are saying. Definitely for coming at it from the point of view of an economist, you can see why economists would say, well, this is going to make it more expensive on the grounds that like, presumably the mandate is there for a reason, which is that the Commerce Department was worried that absent the mandate, this kind of childcare would not be supplied. If providing this kind of childcare ended up was in fact a great way of saving money over the grand scheme of things and reducing turnover and so on and so forth, then in the world of economists, the chip manufacturers would already have done it and there wouldn't have been any need for a mandate. So the so the existence of the mandate is evidence that it is an extra cost of some type. I mean, that's a bias in, among the economists who were criticizing this move as non-essential to the imperative, the security imperative of having a chips plant. They say like, 
this is an extra, this is social engineering, and and maybe so, but also it's undeniable that a lack of affordable childcare keeps people out of the workforce more likely to be women. So for economists to, the, the more conservative ones, not to see that I think is, just shows some of the biases they might have. I think the, the argument in favor of it is that it, you know, it's going to make these companies a lot more competitive in a tight labor market, and it makes the jobs more attractive. Well, I mean, that's two different things, Elizabeth. So let's unpack that a little bit. If it makes the jobs more attractive, then that is some kind of an extra labor cost, like in the grand sort of push pull between labor and capital, like is is. To the a first approximation, it's kind of a zero sum game, um, which, in terms of being competitive, if you want the com- company to be competitive, what the company wants is lower labor costs, not higher labor costs, right? Yes, and there is a a labor shortage now, and if the jobs aren't that attractive, it'll it will be hard harder for these companies to hire workers. Right. And I don't think anyone is opposed to the companies having wonderful childcare. I think the opposition to this comes from the idea that it's being mandated, right? Like if it was good for them, they would do it anyway and you wouldn't need the mandate. Mm. I mean, companies have to jump through hoops to get public money all the time. Right. I mean, it's not unusual. Federal contractors have to pay their workers a certain minimum. They have to give certain minimum benefits. This isn't government contracting this chips money, but it's the the requirement is on companies that take more than one hundred and fifty million dollars in subsidies and loans. So why not? Why shouldn't the government put some strings on that money? The thing it reminds me of is do you remember when the government bailed out all of the banks in 2008 with TARP. Mm -hmm. And then as part of that TARP funding, which the banks didn't even have any choice of, at least here, like the chip manufacturers can choose whether or not they want to do this deal. The banks didn't have any choice. They, They were forced to take that money from the government. And then as part of that money, there was a whole bunch of strings attached in terms of executive pay and, you know, private jet travel and all of that kind of thing. And the banks were like, I didn't even want to take this money. Why are you stopping me from traveling on my private jet? But yeah, you're absolutely right that in almost all areas of government contracting, there are lots of rules about what vendors can and can't do. And in a way, I mean, this isn't technically a government contract. They're not selling services to the government. They're just, you know, selling services to people buying chips and who often aren't the government. But still... You know, it's entirely rational and okay for anyone who's subsidizing anything to attach strings and quid pro quos to that subsidy. I feel like this is such a norm for any kind of government funds that I, I'm not even sure I understand why it's controversial. The argument, I think, uh, political argument is like, this is social justice engineering on the part of the Biden administration trying to do its liberal agenda. So but it if, is, right? I mean, I mean, kind it, it of. It clearly is. Yeah, yeah. But I guess it depends. Like, I mean, from our point of view, where we think about childcare, you know, not as just a social justice issue, but as like an economic imperative. It seems obvious that it's not. It, it's not to be dismissed and, or disparaged as something that's political or partisan. It's like, I mean, it shouldn't be political, but it is. No, I mean, like, if you think of the political spectrum from left to right, this seems to me to be naturally something where the left and the right can disagree that the right would want to be laissez-faire and be like if it makes economic sense let them do it because it makes economic sense if it doesn't make economic sense then don't like mandate something that makes no economic sense and the left would be like no there are good reasons for mandating which are you know something to do with you know increasing female participation in the workforce and stuff stuff and there is this idea that it is the role of government to step into the market and like put your thumb on the scale in the direction to which you, you you know it wants to go. And that is a very natural left-right tension. And it seems to me very natural that a left-wing government would want to do this kind of thing and that a right-wing opposition would not want to do yeah. this kind of thing. I, I, sure. don't, I don't think it makes sense to say that it shouldn't be political. This does seem to be a pretty naturally political difference here. The, um, the New York Times on Friday morning had a great example of um, during World War II – 
the president required factories to hire both white and black workers. And that was controversial social engineering at the time. Now it would be, it's the, like, it's the law. You can't discriminate and only hire white workers. Um, but at the time, right, that's the same thing. It gets criticized from the right. Like, you can't put a mandate on us not to discriminate. Like, it's just the, the window opens wider, the Overton window, right? Eventually, it won't be political, maybe, to say to companies, you have to have a child care plan if you want to take $100 million. There's another political aspect to it as well, though, which is that the far right doesn't necessarily want to increase female labor participation for a variety of reasons, particularly among, like, let's say, far right evangelicals. Uh, there's, there's still a lot of sense that, you know, they, they don't necessarily want women in the workplace. Um, J.D. Vance, in particular, ran on a platform where he argued that instead of subsidizing women who work, that there has to be another economic workaround that allows women to stay home or encourages them to stay home and, and you know, take care of kids and so on. That's also social engineering. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but that's another natural, as you say, like that is a clear political position right like yeah. women should stay at home and not enter the workforce is something that politicians say and certain people agree with and will vote for those politicians and those politicians are nearly always on the right so like again i feel like this is like a genuinely political disagreement but there's policy engineering that goes behind something like that women should be encouraged to stay home. So the policy engineering would be like not having paid parental leave. So that pushes women out of the workforce, not having subsidized childcare. All that is social engineering that has, whether intended or not, and I would argue intended, has the social engineering results. All of that combines to be social engineering on the flip side of this CHIPS Act, where it keeps mostly women out of the labor force or in part-time roles, et cetera. It's just not viewed that way. This is a more clear, you can see it kind of thing. Yeah, and 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 the big difference is that this is new and those other things you're talking about are old, yes, right? And so people always, you know, people always have a status quo bias. And they're like, wherever we're at right now is basically, what, you know, unless it's bad, you know, we're happy yes. with it. And so then, And so then if you introduce something new like this, then you're saying like the status quo is bad and then people get upset if you say that the status quo is bad because they like the status quo. Yes. But practically speaking, it does seem like their unemployment is is really low. There is a shortage of childcare workers. It makes sense for the federal government to encourage more cheaper childcare, right? I mean, I guess it's political to say that, but it seems to make sense. Yeah. I mean, this is this is the big question, right? Which is like absent this mandate would they have done it anyway? Mm. Good question. Some of the Taiwanese chip makers um, I was reading have childcare on site in Taiwan. Yeah. A few years ago, I talked to some guy in Vermont who had like a maple syrup factory or something, and he was having trouble hiring people, and then he was having trouble retaining people. So he built his own childcare site, you know, by the factory, and he said, like, now he doesn't lose anyone because they need it. We're already attached to work because of the health insurance. So you add the layer of like, we'll take care of your kids for you. People will never quit their jobs. I mean, maybe that's not what you want, but you know. I, I do like the idea in, in an ideal world, um, this mandate is, a, is one of those things where maybe the companies wouldn't have done it anyway, but they would have been wrong not to do it. And they're going to wind up ultimately saving money as a result of following the mandate. And they'll be like, thank you, Mr. Biden, for forcing us to do this thing we wouldn't have otherwise done, because it turns out to have been wonderful for us. I mean, that's the argument the Commerce Department is making, essentially. Let's stick with politics for the second segment. We're going to talk about President Biden's first veto after the break. This episode of Slate Money is brought to you by Season 3 of The Relentless, the hit podcast redefining success. Whether you're an entrepreneur or just someone looking for a little inspiration, The Relentless has got you covered. Join host Kristen Meinzer as she gathers the best advice on how to move fearlessly in business and beyond. Learn when and how to quit with former poker champ Annie Duke. 
Discover how to face fear head on with Michelle Curran, the second woman to fly as lead solo in the Air Force Thunderbirds. Or hear how nonprofit executive Stacey Smedley is revolutionizing the construction industry to combat climate change. The Relentless moves past generic business advice to bring you inspiring stories and insights from trailblazers finding creative ways to succeed. From Slate Studios and Century 21 Real Estate, The Relentless is one podcast you don't want to miss. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Slate Money is sponsored this week by ZipRecruiter. And yep, industries are still hiring this spring. The job market is still hot. People still need to fill huge numbers of open positions. It is as hard as it's ever been, whether it's e-commerce, healthcare, hospitality. These are the areas which are seeing the most growth. If you need to hire qualified candidates ASAP for hospitality or any other industry, you need ZipRecruiter, which has powerful matching technology that invites candidates to apply for your job. So let ZipRecruiter keep your team growing strong no matter what the industry. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash money. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash M-O-N-E-Y. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Okay, Elizabeth, what is this bill that passed both the House and the Senate and that Biden is vetoing? So the Senate and the House this week voted to overturn a Labor Department rule that allows uh, retirement funds to take into consideration things like um, ESG requirements in determining how to allocate their portfolios. And so there was a bipartisan um, resolution that overturned this because, well, for the same political reasons that we're talking about. But in the Senate in particular, there were two Democrats that voted for it. Uh, Joe Manchin, predictably, and then John Tester, who is a Democrat from uh, Montana. So it looks like Biden is going to veto this, and it's his first veto. So it's significant in that sense. So this is frustrating to me on many levels. (laughs) Um, Firstly, because this Department of Labor rule that is trying to get overturned is... It basically doesn't even say anything. <laughs> it just says, you know what, if you want to, if you think that something is going to make money, you can invest in that thing. If you think that ESG is a profitable strategy, then go ahead and do ESG. If you think that climate change is the you know, world's biggest long-term investment risk and you think that the best way to position yourself financially is by investing in companies that are going to be good at adapting to climate change and mitigating climate change, then that's an entirely natural investment thesis that a lot of people have, and you're allowed to invest in that thesis. You know, this is a deeply conservative libertarian kind of rule. It's basically saying, you do you, investors, we're not going to interfere with you. Yeah, that's why it's bizarre that there's any pushback. It's not a requirement. It's just kind of a knee-jerk pushback against ESG categorically, you know, for for political optics reasons. But the crazy thing is that even if you overturn the rule, there's still no rule against investors using ESG factors as part of what they invest in. (laughs) Like everyone in the world, every institutional investor in the world pretty much uses these ESG factors. You're not going to stop them doing that like you can't make that illegal the department of labor under trump tried they put out this rule saying if you use esg factors that's going to hurt your investment returns and everyone's like no it's not that's like if it was going to hurt our investment returns we wouldn't be doing it um but like the rule was which is which is why like a bunch of people i phoned when that trump rule came out you know, from the American Petroleum um, Institute and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and all of these Republicans were like, yeah, no, like, that's, you know, they weren't in favor of that Trump rule, right? Because it made no sense. So the Department of Labor rule was basically just clarifying, like rolling back the Trump rule and saying, clarifying and saying, no, no, you're allowed to invest in something which you think is going to make money. Well, I think it's, it's, some of it was just the language in the the Trump era uh, statement, which, which, 
said specifically that retirement plan fiduciaries could only consider pecuniary factors. And I I guess it boils down to whether, you know, you can make an argument. I, I think the Biden reversal of it is just allowing fund managers to make an argument that ESG is a pecuniary factor. Exactly. Like, the, all of the, every single ESG investor in the world says that it's a pecuniary factor, right? So the, the Trump rule didn't stop them doing it, but it kind of made it harder for them. And they were worried, and some fund managers were worried that if they did it, they would run into regulatory pushback for doing it. And so then the Biden rule basically just clari- like rolled back the Trump rule and clarified, no, listen, if you want to do it, you can. Wow, yeah. It's incredibly dumb and just seems like a political show that Congress passed this bill and now it has to be vetoed. Political theater. It's theater, yeah. But, but like, there is, you can see, and especially in the mansion vote, you can see what's going on here, right? If you are running a business that emits a lot of carbon, you know, you're in the oil industry or the coal industry or something like that, then ESG investors are very likely to be underweight your stock or not own it at all. And if a huge amount of global institutional investors are underweight your stock or not owning it at all, that is going to weigh on your share price. If you try and pass a rule that makes it illegal for them to use such considerations when deciding whether or not to buy your stock, then it is possible that they will then feel forced to buy your stock. And if they buy your stock, your stock will go up. And then if you are, like Joe mentioned, and you own a coal company or like a very large stake in the coal company, then maybe your stock in that coal company will go up and you will make money. But you don't even have to call it ESG if you're an investor and you're looking at long term and you look at an oil company and you look at kind of the state of things and you say, okay, in the short term, these company is, good, is making a lot of money, but look at all this other stuff being innovative, maybe in the long term, we should diversify or move away from that. Look at all these electric cars. Look at all these wind farms. Like you don't have to call it ESG. It's just like (laughs) doing your job. The investment thesis is is pretty simple, right? Like (laughs) stock market investors are optimists by their nature, right? If you're not an optimist, you tend not to buy stocks at all. The whole point of buying stocks is like, I have money now, And instead of spending that money now, what I want to do is invest it and have even more money at some like point way down in the future, right? Because I think the world, or at least my portfolio is going to be better in the future than it is today. And you look forward and you think to yourself, well, you know, if the future is a terrible hellscape of, you know, wildfires and hurricanes, then... I don't believe the future is better and I should just be spending my money today. If you do believe the future is better, then implicitly you you believe that the world is going to be at least somewhat successful in moving to a net zero economy where we manage to mitigate or avoid the worst effects of climate change. And if you look at what that economy is going to look like, you know, it basically doesn't, there isn't a place for it for, you know, coal and oil. You know, we're we're getting rid of all of that. And so all of the big coal coal and oil companies today are ultimately going to wind up, you know, either in the renewables business or, you know, that large chunk of um, future cash flows is going to wind up going to zero. If that large revenue stream ends up going to zero, then that means their stock today is going to be less attractive. It's a very simple and obvious investment thesis that most global investors actually hold because if they didn't hold it they probably wouldn't be investing in the stock market at all because they'd be like you know going out and spending all of their money today because tomorrow we die yeah that's uh, which also sort of brings me to the question under the trump clarification did anybody actually get in trouble for taking esg into consideration or anything like that or was it just you know the the fact that it exists So the answer is, like, not on a broad level, but on a narrow level. Like, the Texas state pension funds, and I think in Oklahoma, I don't know. There were a couple of state-directed pension funds where they wouldn't, they refused to invest with money managers who had ESG something, something, something. It was a bit weird, Um, especially when it came to, like, borrowing money as well. They wouldn't use underwriters who had 
ESG funds, and that ended up increasing their borrowing costs. And so, yeah, like there were a few like state level decisions that were made, but like no one got in trouble as far as I know for just having these funds in general. It's so dumb. It's so, <laughs> it's just so dumb. It's, uh, it's upsetting. But it's dumb and upsetting on some level, but on another level, it is clearly uh, an attack vector that Republicans think is going to be profitable for them in terms of you know, 2024 elections. For sure. That if you if you attack people for being like woke, far left, liberal climate tree huggers or something, then that's a good way of winning votes, which may or may not be true. Yeah, Republicans have every incentive to portray anything that Biden does as overreach, regardless of how reasonable it is. It's just, it's just weird to me that the first thing they pass that, they force him to veto is like it's about like the employment retirement income securities act of 1974 you know it's like (laughs) come on like you can find something a little bit more red meat than that surely it's actually kind of comforting because even if even if he didn't veto it it doesn't sound like it would mean anything you know like you'd investors would still be able to take esg into account yeah, there. it's it's all it's all just political theater. Like it it doesn't matter if he vetoes or not or if they pass it or not. It has no significance whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna talk about mortgages after the break. Slate Money is supported by First Republic Bank, which, full disclosure, is my bank. You set your financial goals years ago and now you're reaching them. You're ready for the next level and new challenges, scaling even greater heights. You're ready to do more than you thought because you didn't come this far to only come this far. With First Republic, you get a personal banker, a consistent point of contact who's ready to sit down and help you reach and exceed your financial goals. You've worked hard to get to where you are and First Republic is ready to help you go the rest of the way. To find out more about First Republic's extraordinary service, visit firstrepublic.com. That's firstrepublic.com. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use or that can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on creditworthiness. Rates as of January 1st, 2023. Oh, Felix, you have to explain this to us because I read the story and I didn't understand it in the Wall Street Journal. It said that Amazon employees will be able to get mortgages using their restricted stock units as collateral through Better.com, which is a mortgage company. Correct. That is more or less the message that I got from the Wall Street Journal article as well. Um, And not that I want to just turn this into a Wall Street Journal bashing exercise. No. But like, I just read the article and went, this doesn't make any sense. So then I found the better.com press release. And I'm like, yeah, I still don't get it. And it pointed to the better.com website. So I went to the better.com website. They have a whole web page just for Amazon employees explaining this. And I read that web page. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so then I talked to the better.com spokespeople. And they're like, I'm like, Look, I don't understand this. Can you explain this to me? And they came back with like some answers, but then the answers they gave me didn't align with what they said on the web page. And I talked to the Amazon people and they were like, and what they said kind of kind of did and kind of didn't align with what was said on the web page. And cards on the table here. Like I am still reporting this story. It is incre- it is much more complicated than it looks. Um I can say with almost complete certainty that no one has managed to completely, like no one in the press has been able to completely understand it. And 
I don't know whether anyone in Amazon really completely understands it. I'm quite sure that the um, better.com PR folk don't completely understand it because they are finding it incredibly difficult to answer my questions. I'm reasonably sure that the people who drafted the better.com webpage designing this product don't completely understand it because like there's a whole bunch of stuff on that webpage that doesn't make any sense. And, and I'm, and like on some level, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the better.com CEO doesn't understand it either because what the comments he gave on the record to the wall street journal also don't make any sense. So it's kind of amazing that you can get like a big company like Amazon, a big PR roll out a big like set of announcements like this about a significant financial product that it's meant to be worth you know millions of dollars to various amazon employees and it just seems to be a you know a, a just held together with twine and duct tape and, and you're like what i think you have to explain why it doesn't make sense yeah. Okay. So there's there's a bunch of things that don't make sense here. Um, and they all have potential answers. I'm not saying like it cannot make sense. I'm just saying it doesn't make sense. But let's start with what Emily said about RSUs. RSUs are restricted stock units. They are part of the compensation that Amazon employees receive from Amazon. It's a very large part of their compensation historically. And if you stay at Amazon for a certain number of months or years, those RSUs eventually convert into Amazon stock. And then that Amazon stock, if you know all goes according to plan, is worth lots of money and you can sell the Amazon stock and make lots of money and that's over and above your salary and you get rich. And lots of Amazon employees over the years have done exactly that. But the RSUs in and of themselves, um, they don't really have value. Like... It would be astonishing to me if Better.com or anyone else lent money against RSUs because RSUs are like the potential to have future stock. But if you leave the company, you don't get the stock. You know, the RSUs become worthless. So they're doing collateral on the unvested RSUs? So that was the first thing that I tried to clear up with them. And they were like, uh, yes, you're quite right about that. Once an RSU vests, it becomes stock so you know we're only lending against vested stock we're not lending against rsus at all and yet the better.com ceo is out there saying oh yeah like we're allowing amazon employees to realize the value of their rsus it's like no you're not yeah okay you are we are not lending against the rsus at all okay so that clears up that what else is confusing so then the next question is what exactly is this product and what it is it's a mortgage and what it what they're saying is one of the main reasons why people sell their Amazon stock if they're Amazon employees is because they want to make a down payment on a home. And this has been a common use case and there are thousands and thousands of homes across the Pacific Northwest that have been, you know, where the down payment has been made by people selling Amazon stock that they got from Amazon in return for working for Amazon. The problem is that right now Amazon stock isn't doing very well. And people don't want to sell their Amazon stock because it isn't worth very much, or it's not worth as much as it used to be. And they're saying, like, I would rather hold on to that Amazon stock in the hope that it goes up and is worth more in the future, rather than feel the need to sell it now in order to make my down payment. And so then better.com is coming along and is saying, that's okay. Instead of using the proceeds from selling Amazon stock to make the down payment, we will lend you the money for the down payment by allowing you to borrow against your Amazon stock. So it becomes like almost like a zero money down mortgage. You have like the the 20% down payment is borrowed against your Amazon stock and then the 80% is just a conventional mortgage. Oh. Also on the better.com and you know they're they're charging between 0.25 and 2.5% above market rates, which in, in this interest rate environment is a lot. So is, is there a bet just that, you know, they're, they're taking more risk to push these higher rates on people? Okay, so that's, that's the other question I have. Like, <laughs> what, what is this market rate that you're pricing off? And it, it seems like the market rate they're pricing off is like the, the Freddie Mac mortgage rate. Okay. okay. And if you scroll down to the bottom of the 
of the better.com page, it gives you an example of a mortgage at like 7.625%, which works out at like a 7.9 something percent APR, which is like a really high interest rate. And they give you the example of that mortgage on 100% of the value of the home. Like literally 100% of the mortgage is at this 7.625% oh rate. Don't do that. And I'm like, what? No, that's crazy. Who would take out a 100% mortgage at a 7.625 rate? Um, is this one mortgage or is it two mortgages? And so I asked Better.com, is this one or is it two? And they're like, it's two. You have a standard mortgage for the 80%, which by the way, you have to get from Better.com. You can't take that from anyone else. And then you have a different securities-based loan, which is just for the down payment. And that will be at the higher rate. And then they said, but the securities loan is also a property, there's a property lien on it. And I'm like, but in that case, it's a normal mortgage. And then they said in the press release, they said it's non-recourse, which I'm like, what? That means I'm not personally responsible for it. They're like they're using all of these words like, you know, non-recourse and property lien and 100% and 20%. And I'm like, there's, there's various different ways you could have structured this. But however you've structured it, like, something you're saying to me is just wrong. Also, don't don't borrow 100% of the mortgage. You have to make, am I wrong? You have to make a down payment on your mortgage. You can't just do a, this is in 2004. <laughs> well, no, it's not, well, I mean, like, you, but even if you borrow 100%, like, you know, it makes sense for the 20% sort of second lien to be at a higher interest rate. It doesn't make yeah. sense for the entire 100% to no. be at a higher interest no. rate. no. And then it also the other thing is that you need twice as much stock as the amount you're putting down in down payment. So if you're putting down like a hundred thousand dollar down payment, you need two hundred thousand dollars of Amazon stock to tie up against that down payment. What happens if the value of the stock goes down? So that's that's the innovation of the product. Is that <laughs> if the value of the stock goes down, then you don't face a margin call. Okay. I mean, mortgage companies are really desperate for business right now. This is. <laughs> to me, the bigger picture story here. Better.com has been through rounds and rounds of layoffs. Mortgage companies are desperate for business, but like, it's really hard for me to work out how, like, depending on which bits of the website and the press release and the communications from the PR people you believe, it's hard for me to really believe that this is actually an attractive product for Amazon employees. But I have the Amazon people on the record saying, yeah, this is all part of our attempt to improve our employees' financial wellness. So you're saying this is not actually better.com for Amazon employees than just getting regular mortgage <laughs> on the market. <laughs> well, I mean, like the idea is, right, that this is for cash poor Amazon employees who don't have enough cash to put down the down payment and who want to buy a house and who are faced with the choice of, Either I sell my Amazon stock to get that down payment or I borrow against it. And I am such a great and loyal Amazon employee that I'm convinced my stock is going to go up. And so I should hold on to it and just borrow against it at 8% instead of selling it and using that. And so basically, effectively, anyone who takes advantage of this product is making a bet that their Amazon stock is going to appreciate at more than 8% per year. Which seems like, you know, I mean, maybe, but like you're already extremely exposed to Amazon already, right? Because you work there. You're getting like 100% of your income from Amazon. You have a huge chunk of Amazon stock. Why would you make that Amazon exposure even bigger by placing this like leveraged bet that, you're, that Amazon stock is going to perform well? Plus, if you took that money and you bought a house, I mean, you get a big tax break on the mortgage, right, interest. I mean, it might be better to just buy a house with the money than just wait and see what happens to Amazon's stock, wouldn't it? Well, you are, uh, either way, you're buying a house, right? The question is, do you sell the Amazon oh, right. stock to make the down, down payment or do you use or do you borrow against the Amazon stock to make the down payment? Um, the housing market's really suffering right now because of all the tech workers with the lower stock prices or who have gotten laid off, like um, the where the prices, home prices are declining the most is in those, those places. In California. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, we all have this hidden quantum of 
quasi wealth, like every almost everyone with a mortgage in, in, in the United States right now has a mortgage, which on the open market, if their lender was to sell it would not fetch the amount of money that you borrowed, you know, you've kind of made money in some weird way on that. Um, let's have a numbers round. Elizabeth. What's your number? Uh, my number is 26%, and this is a little bit related to our last segment. Uh, that's the portion of the market for first-time home buyers, and it's the smallest share of overall home buyers on record. And now, in, in uh, 2022, the average income for people who are putting a uh, down payment on a first house was 90K, and that's up from 70K in 2019. So it's it's much harder to buy your first house now the, the expense of it is much higher <sighs> not a great time <laughs> it's rarely a good time to be a, a first time home buyer like you know depending on where you live but especially now it's hard because you just don't have that home equity that you can roll over into the new house um i have i'm you know since this is a, such a political episode i'm going to do a political number which is 4,602.32, which is the number of dollars that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wound up reimbursing. She re reimbursed something called Cultural Brokerage Agency, LLC, for the cost of hotel rooms at the Carlisle Hotel. And this is this crazy story um, about the Met Gala. I don't know if you guys remember, but AOC turned up at the Met Gala in a ga in a custom gown which said "Tax the Rich" on it, mm -hmm. and there was a fitting for that gown, and the fitting took place in a room at the Carlisle Hotel. And then on the day of the Met Gala, there was another room at, at the Carlisle Hotel where. She was like, you know, poured into this dress and it was all sewn up around her and she got her hair and makeup done and all the rest of it. And for various reasons that are a bit unclear, but involve like the House Ethics Committee, somehow at the end of it all, she ended up paying $4,602 to reimburse um, basically the fashion designers representatives for the cost of the hotel room. And it's pretty obvious that they never in that, never anticipated that like AOC would pay for the hotel room. But like in order to try and cut off this ethics investigation at the past, she decided to write this check. It, the total check she wrote was $5,579.99 to Brother Velies, who was the designer of the frog, which is, you know, a non-negligible amount of money for someone on a, member of Congress salary. So it was meant to just be like a giveaway and then people found out about it and got mad. So she had to pay up the money. Something like that. Like it, it's an interesting question. Like, you know, there, there was this whole back and forth about like how much should she pay for the frock? She didn't keep the frock. So she gave the frock back, but like who the hell else is going to wear that frock? But then the question was like, what's, what's a good rental amount that we can charge you for the frock? And the first and the first attempt they sent her as an invoice was $1,300 to rent the frock. And then they, she, they phoned her back and said, really? And they said, oh, actually, no, call it $300. Like, no one knows. Like, it's, hard, <laughs> it's impossible to put a, a, a number on these things. I don't understand. Did, did <laughs> other politicians don't run into these kinds of issues because they wouldn't look good? And, like, no one's paying Mitch McConnell to wear a pretty dress. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not that she was getting paid to wear the dress. It's just that like fashion designers were offering her this dress and that was considered a, a freebie of value and members of Congress aren't allowed to accept freebies of value. Oh, okay. And so she needs to reimburse the provider of the freebie for the value of the freebie. And then, and then so there's all this question about like, what is the value I receive from wearing a frock for one day? And I'll reimburse that. And then she's like, well, I, sh I guess like the other thing I did was I went to this hotel room and got a fitting. And so it's part of the value I received, like the cost of the hotel room. It's <laughs> silly. It's kind of weird. But beware accepting a free invitation to the Met Gala because it could wind up costing you many thousands of dollars. If you're a member of Congress. <laughs> if you're a member of Congress. Um, Emily, what's your number? My number is $79.99. That is 
how much you might have to pay to obtain a box of Raspberry Rally Girl Scout cookies on the secondary market. This is a new Girl <laughs> Scout cookie flavor. <laughs> it's like a thin mint. It's like a thin raspberry cookie dipped in chocolate. It's new this year. Sounds amazing. Typically, you only pay $5 a box for Girl Scout cookies, but these sold out. So you have to go to eBay or wherever you get your secondary market Girl Scout cookie <laughs> needs met. And um, yeah, and that's that's my number. I don't have much else to say, except I like Girl Scout cookies like like every other human being in the world. I didn't know about this flavor. Were you slow off the mark this year and failed to get the Raspberry Rally? I, I am so behind. I don't even know. Usually, I'm not that great about figuring out who's you know, what parent is selling their kids cookies. So I wind up where I live, there'll be like a stand or something where the Girl Scouts are like in front of the supermarket. And then I just buy a bunch of cookies. I didn't even know about these cookies, which sound really good, but I'm not paying $80 for them. No. I feel like buying them on the secondary market, it like <laughs> defeats the purpose, right? Yes. Because the money by definition is not going to the Girl Scout. Yes. It's going to whoever paid the Girl Scout, yes. who would be like some profiteer, we yes. can't allow that. We cannot. Yeah. We, we can't. And um, <laughs> the Girl Scouts are upset about it. They don't like people profiteering off the Raspberry Rally. Yeah, it's, it is, does seem wrong, I guess. Millions of listeners out there, if you have tasted these Raspberry Rally cookies, can you please write in on Slate Money at Slate.com and tell us how good they are and whether they are worth buying and we will report back. Are they five five dollars good or eighty dollars good? Exactly. Um, I think that's it for us this week. Thank you to Anna Phillips for producing. Thank you all for listening, and we will be back next week with even more Slate Money. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, bridesmaids in the Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.